Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center of Teaching Excellence. How's the weather outside? Well, I, I tell you, the weather is always perfect here. No matter what goes on outside, we're always about 71 degrees in here. We don't know whether it's sunny or storming. There could be rain, there could be humidity, and here it's always perfect. So I think it's the best, best climate for learning and no way for people to get distracted. So uh, my name is Augie Grant. I have the uh, privilege of coordinating the activities of the Center for Teaching Excellence. And uh, I'll tell you a little more about uh, CTE at the end of the presentation. We want to jump right into today's presentation. Uh, with us today is one of the most uh, distinguished educators we have on uh, campus, one of the best people we have to help you advance your knowledge of pedagogy. Uh, professor Matthew Irvin is an associate professor in the Department of Educational Psychology and Research. Um, he is also director of the Yvonne and Schuler Moore Child Development Research Center. He's co-director of the South Carolina Center for Excellence for the Advancement of the Workforce and Knowledge Economy. Uh, his research area focuses on the development and learning of rural youth. Uh, it focuses, I'm sorry, his specific topics, educational attainment, STEM learning, academic motivation, math course, course taking, school context, online and distance education, risk and resilience, peer relations and bullying, and youth with disabilities. Basically, everything you're going to encounter, anything you need to encounter in order to know and teach, he's been there. Um, Perhaps more importantly, he's published 40 peer-reviewed journal articles and has secured approximately $12 million in grant funding from a wide variety of federal and other funding sources. He is a person who lives, eats, and breathes education, and he's going to share with you his perspective. Thank you. Dr. Irvin. All right, thank you all for coming in today. All right, <laughs> didn't expect that. So. <laughs> Hey, do me. Um, yeah, thank you for coming in and braving the storm. Um, so I wanted to do a little think, pair, share to kind of get us started. This is a workshop about effective pedagogies, you know, what we kind of know might make a difference in kids and students' uh, learning and achievement. So a lot of us, you know, kind of try what we, we learned, what we experienced. And I want you to kind of take a minute to think about that. What are the main teaching approaches you use, or think you might use if you haven't taught yet, um, the particular strategies, and why do you think you might use those or you do use those? What's kind of the reason behind that? What was the influencing factor? They're like, oh yeah, that's what I do and that's why I'm gonna do it, okay? So take a moment, think about a couple, and share with other people at your table. Yeah. I think everybody's about had time to kind of share some, some ideas. Okay. So what are some of the main teaching ones? The few I heard was questioning, experiential learning, Socratic method. Then just You want to share a little bit about questioning, how you use that, and why? What is art? What is art? What is art? Not just out. <laughs> so, so it's something beyond definition? I think you can define it, but not in like two seconds. I don't know. I would have to think Take it. your time. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, what is art? It's like the freedom. Okay. And how you express yourself in different ways. So it's a method of expression? Maybe. Yeah. So does that mean it's a tangible thing you can identify or not? I think it's a heart. Yeah. It's a heart. So when you go into an art museum, what do you see? Hot sweat? I don't know. Art. <laughs> you see art. So do you see art or do you see art? Art. Okay. So how is what you see in a museum relevant to heart, relevant to art? Do you mean heart or heart? You said heart, H-E-R-T? No, I said heart. I think it's oh, heart. Oh, H-A-R-D? Yeah, to, to define it, yeah. Okay, so it's challenging. Right. So what makes 
why is it challenging to define? Because it, I feel like it can be everything. So <coughs> this is art. Maybe in a way. Yeah. How so? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> it's an art. And that's the way Socratic method goes. It's a constant back and forth question. I see. Just do it with me, but I feel kind of uncomfortable, so that's like. Well, there's one possibility. Socrates was not popular. Exactly. Well, he was dead. He was put to death. We're still talking about him 2,500 years later. No, chemistry, it's not. How about the experiential learning? What is that? How do you use that? What was the reasoning behind using that? Yeah, so um, speaking from my experience, I help teach an interprofessional education class where we take students, it's an elective course for all of the health science students to come together and learn how to operate as a team before they graduate and then go function on healthcare teams. So our experiential learning processes are presenting ethical dilemmas to students, presenting them with cases that they have to come up with, a team-based treatment plan, things like that. And what's the sort of basis reason behind using that? I mean, is it just simply what you all do? It's just kind of been agreed upon? Yeah, we're I gonna think do the, this? the basis is just because that's typically the type of environment that health science students will end up in, and very little, uh, very little curriculum occurs in their respective programs on how do you function as a team. So it's more of like, can we bring these students together prior to graduation? So that they can actually learn from and with each other how to function on a team. Okay. And Jack, right? Yes. Um, so what's the, your rationale behind using the Socratic method? So I don't use it in every course. I don't use it, I primarily use it in advanced level courses, specifically those which require a lot of discussion because you're trying to work out the big problems. Uh, I've used it successfully and frequently in courses I've taught on ethics. Um, I have used it to a more limited degree in courses I've taught on uh, art, teaching mostly religious studies. I also cross into a lot of other disciplines. Okay. So it allows me to engage the students uh, directly, get more out of them and challenge their suppositions, you know, kind of poke around the foundations of their ideas a little bit without, um, you know, it makes, sometimes it makes them uncomfortable uh, because that's. But it's involved in passing a little more mm -hmm. Okay. So just kind of in your own experience, you thought that would be effective in, yes. in this setting and advanced course. Yes, Julia? I feel like this can be beneficial, but maybe not just like I'm teaching her in science, and I feel like there's not such a broad answer sometimes. So when you do something with the philosophy, I think it could be really good, but I don't know if it's so. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's not effective for everybody. Right. Yeah. And, that, beyond doubt. and that's a good point. A lot of these things I'm going to show you may have a time and place, you know, certain undergrad class where you're just trying to get basic facts, basic, you know, definitions, concepts down versus something more advanced like that. So how about this table? Any particular main technique you all talked about and rationale? Yes. Um, so I, in chemistry, and uh -huh. most people consider chemistry abstract. Mm -hmm. So usually the technique is to excite the students. And you can only do that when you throw out points. <laughs> so more like uh, get questions to relate chemistry to the daily activities and give points for that. So that way you're excited. They want to know how not abstract chemistry is compared to like the usual, um, the usual feeling that everyone has about chemistry being boring. So you, I usually use the technique. Try to relate it to daily activities and then throw out points for people to grab. Okay. Not make it too. Um, don't make it look like a competition per se, but not something to scare them away, but something to excite them towards the subject. So. Okay, to so motivate them motivate a little bit, them, yeah. we'd say in my field, so uh, and get them engaged. Um, and then what's kind of the reason behind that? Where'd that come from? It's Where'd you get that? Usually the term is chemistry is boring and hard. Okay. So I want to break that ice. So kind of just your yeah. own, like, mm -hmm. gotta make this more. Yeah. All right. So one thing I want to, do today. So, I mean, I think we kind of heard a lot of it's just our own perceptions, beliefs of what may or may not work or needs to be done, or, you know, kind of just this is the approach we take, always take, we think it fits best. Okay, I heard things like that, correct? So, I want to show you a little bit of, or not a little bit, a good deal of research here on what the data, what existing research 
shows is impactful for kids learning. Okay, I'm an educational researcher, educational scientist. So I always stress in my classes, that's my frame of reference. What does existing theory and research say should work, shouldn't work, why, why not? Okay, so rather than sort of, you know, just kind of your own experience, belief, so hopefully shift that a little bit for you today. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some research from John Hattie. Um, he's in Australia, I believe, still. And he did a synthesis of meta-analyses. And meta-analyses, if you don't know, are a type of study where you go out, you identify the parameters of studies you want to combine you go out and find those studies that meet those parameters. You could say, I want only experimental studies, or I want experimental or observational, only focus on this age group, only focus on this particular topic, whatever are the parameters. And you statistically synthesize all the results from the studies that fit that. OK, a lot of meta-analyses synthesize. I've seen some down to about 11, 12 studies some in the 20s, 30s, or more, OK? So you're meta-analyzing all the results from those studies. Well, what he did, he sort of did a meta-analysis or synthesis of those meta-analyses. So he went out and got a whole bunch of meta-analyses, and then he statistically synthesized those, OK? And he looks at a lot of different factors that affects learning. He kind of conceptualizes into major categories like school, teaching, the student themselves, the teacher, um, their characteristics, the curricula that's being used, home family, and there's a few other things in here at times, uh, peers, um, blanking on, there's something else in here sometimes. But these broad areas, trying to look at all these. And he's looked at, like I think he's up to 250-ish things he's looked at in these meta-analyses that affect kids' learning. In his first book in 2009, he did this synthesis of over 800 meta-analyses. Okay? And that was the initial work. Then in 2012, he followed up with another book where he really, and it's a really good book because it really kind of talks to teachers. How do you implement? So if you want to look into this more, highly recommend the 2012 book where he really goes kind of thing by factor by factor and really says, this is what this means. This is how you may want to implement. At that point, he had added another 100 meta-analyses to his work. And then in 2015, he published an article. You can just Google the title and go get it. It's out there. Um, applicability of a, a visible learning to higher education. At this point, he's up to 1,200 meta-analyses. And this is data from 65,000 studies. And more than 250,000 students across the whole age range of K through 12 and into the post-secondary years. Okay? Looking at an index of how strongly things are related to learning, we call effect size, 150,000 effect sizes across all those studies. He's compiling and synthesizing. Now in this article, he summarizes some of the key findings for college age students. Um, however, he actually acknowledges in there that most of the findings are from K-12 um, kids, but contends that the, the results, the applicability, would be very similar to college-age kids. And we know that, actually. Learning, once you're an adolescent, how you learn and so forth doesn't change much, really. Um, you know, we get a little better at, at strategizing, things like that. But by and large, even adult professional development, adult learning theories are very similar to learning theories um, for kids. So how we learn doesn't really change that much, especially once you hit adolescence. So an important point to think about. A lot of times you go out there and you see research that looks at this particular method, and they may be comparing it to nothing else or business as usual, right? 
look at how it works in this class where a teacher just does what they've always been doing versus, hey, here's this new method. And more often than not, you see a benefit, right? You're comparing something that you think is better to something else, and lo and behold, we often see a benefit, right? So it kind of seems like, hey, everything works, great. But what his work really does shows you the magnitude of the impact on learning across all these studies and how different things might compare to other things, okay? So which may be more impactful on learning than others, okay? And again, that magnitude um, is expressed in effect size. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Any questions so far? Yes. Um, with those effect sizes and things, um, I know a lot of times whenever people are comparing these strategies, um, because uh, like I come from the field of speech pathology, mm -hmm. and so some of the children and things that we work with are often you know disordered development. Um, so sometimes there will be strategies where it'll say like you know this was better for like 80% of this group. Mm -hmm. Well, I think often sometimes like, people will focus on that 80% and forget about the other 20. Sure. Um, so just like in thinking about this stuff, like I guess I was just asking or saying maybe that like to make sure to like look at the whole picture. Yeah. I guess because cause often sometimes like I think people get so focused in on like this works better, so I'm going to use that and I'm not going to worry about this other. Right. Yeah. No, and that's a great point to bring up and, and something I, I teach in my class. You know, the research findings like this, they're patterns. That doesn't mean they work for everybody, work all the time, or only work for 80%, like you said. So just keep that in mind, right? But on the average, statistically, it is an improvement, right? So you can always think of exceptions to the rule. Oh, didn't work for me, didn't work for sibling, whatnot. But that's okay, right? We're talking overall kind of patterns here. All right, another kind of caveat here. Most of our research in educational sciences is correlational, right? Many of you probably heard the old can't infer causation from correlation, right? Why is that? Anybody know the main issue there? There must be like... Uh may be associated, but the temporal relationship, like from effect to cause, may not be present. Right. It, it may not have that temporal, yeah, exactly. You got to have the, the cause. You do this, you wait and see. Do you see the effect after? If they're at the same time, and not all these studies are. There are some experimental, there are some longitudinal studies that he synthesized. I know I've looked at several of them. So... But that's often the case in cross-sectional kind of correlational research. Other ideas? Well, you never quite know if there's something else underlying that relationship, okay? So in my, one of my areas of research, advanced math course taking, looking at that, the impact of that for kids. Um, you know, we see a correlation. Take more advanced math classes, you do better. But there could be something else, right? They come, the kids taking more advanced math classes are more motivated, to use our term. They like math more. They're more math inclined. They're not math phobic. <laughs> you know, we hear a lot of kids say. Um, they come from a family of engineers, mathematicians, a wealthier family. This family will provide tutoring. A lot of other things could be underlying that relationship, okay? But in our research, we often try and control for those statistically and through other methods, research design. Um, but again, it's still correlational in nature, okay? So he talks about these as influences, gives me a little pause, you know, it's kind of getting very causal language. Um, may not be appropriate, but that's what he uses. So the other kind of key thing here no one study can unequivocally answer this does or doesn't work, right? In research, we need to replicate, see it again and again. And then we're like, okay, yes, we're on to something here. This is consensus. We're seeing it. It's replicated by others. 
Um, just listen to public radio like last week talking about how, I forget what, and I want to say it was like 80% of studies. A lot of times you'll never see it replicated. Something like maybe it was 60, 80, something like that. So you always have to have that. And this kind of gives us some consensus, right? He's synthesizing it across all the published studies out there, what's been replicated in these, essentially across these meta-analyses that he's then synthesized. So it's a way to give us that. So take a moment. I want you to think about which of these you think has the most impact on learning. Rank order them from most to least. And share with each other here for a few minutes what you think has the most impact and why, if you would, too. Oh. All right, sounds like most of the conversations are winding down. I heard several talk about family. Sounded like several thought family was most important. Most agree with that? Yeah. Okay, pretty. Um, how about schools? There's some discussion about schools, what we mean by that. Okay, a little less. <laughs> Students themselves? Mixed, a few, looks like. Peers? Yeah, a few. Teachers? Oh, yeah. Right yeah. Okay. So here's the breakdown. Whoa. I know it is a little surprising, isn't it? What a principal. Do what? Yeah. This one added principles. I didn't include it in that list because obviously, this level, we don't have principles. Um, but overall, across again, all these meta analyses, students themselves and what they do. Mm. Strategies they use for learning as the biggest factor. It's 50-ish percent. The next big is teachers. What are the strategies we use? I want to say it's 25, 30. I don't, I'm not recalling off the top of my head. Most are surprised by this. Home, family is a lot smaller. Right? And if you look at the rankings even overall, like SES, everybody, a lot of people talk about wealth, wealth's it, and wealth is impactful, it has a big impact, but it's 35th or so down the list. A lot of other things, a lot of these other things, students and teachers. And I will say a lot of things he's classifying as students, teachers can have an influence on, which we'll talk about too. How they study, how they approach things, you can try and get them to do this in class to have them use more effective strategies. Okay? So now we're going to get into some of this specifics here. A little bit about what we mean by effect sizes. Um, broadly, it's some sort of statistical index of the size of a relationship or the difference between using this approach versus another approach or business as usual or nothing at all. Again, some sort of index of how large, what's the magnitude of that difference or effect, okay? There's tons of different ones out there. Over 50, I've heard up to possibly 100. Um, a lot of different effect size. How to use is Cohen's D, that's probably the most common one out there. I won't get into all the specifics, but it's a, it's a measure of the uh, amount of the standard deviation units increased by this particular strategy, method, so forth, or whatever you're looking at. You would see a half standard deviation increase, for example, with the 0.5. Okay? There's been some rule of thumbs, uh, thumb in interpretations. Cohen himself said these 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8 were small, medium, and large effects. Others have subsequently put ranges on them, up to 0.3 being a small, 0.4 to 0.6 being medium, and greater than 0.7 being a large effect. Um, again, rules of thumb, some people are caught, and even Cohen was, and he actually laid these out, very cautious of, you know, there's some areas where all we see are sort of small effects. So relative to that thing you're studying, like social emotional development, we often see pretty small effects on the average. 
So an intervention that like hits a point three there could be really impactful within that topic or area. So keep that in mind as well. Um, but again, overall, all the things we've looked at learning, 250-ish things, this provides us some sort of standardized metric of how to look at these. And another thing that Hattie has done, again, going back to kind of the impact of teachers, students, and such, overall, he's put them on this sort of gauge barometer, he calls it, where he shows that just developmentally, if a kid didn't even go to school, we're going to see them possibly um, increase up to 0.15 effect size. Okay, Just natural development. right? We're going to see that change. Typical teacher effects take us up from that 0.15 up to 0.4. Okay? Regardless of what the teacher, on the average, this is the impact of teachers on kids, right? So what Hattie kind of argues is that the hinge <coughs> point is this point four. What can we get on top of that? On top of typical development, typical teacher effects, what can we do differently that's going to boost learning a little bit more? And that hinge point is point four, calls the zone of desired effects and above, okay? You'll see in a minute, he further differentiates these into like sort of these would be an impact and these would be very impactful. And I'm blanking off the top of my head if it's 0.7 or 0.8. Um, but, you know, very powerful things, if you will. And these are going to make a difference, have some impact. Is that clear? All right. So this is the overall effect sizes across all those studies is synthesis. And hey, pretty close to normal distribution, right? Anybody look studies that looks at that? Um, so again, here's the hinge point. Here's that point four, what's green. So a lot of things, as you can see, most things are kind of in that range of developmental or average teacher effects. So in other words, a lot of things, most things, Again, yeah, you see a benefit compared to nothing or business as usual, but it's really no different than what you'd expect regardless of what the teacher did, right? Again, this is sort of the, the benefit of this. You're comparing to others. But there are many other things that add value added, if you will, something in education research on top of teacher effects. A lot of other things we're going to look at now. All right, I'm going to actually pass these out. So what we're going to do, so these are student things, student learning strategies. I want you to take a few minutes and just put an X if you think it would have, actually, harm. Some things do have harm versus very small effects or developmental or teacher effects or what might be desired effects have an, uh, an ability to accelerate learning or a substantial difference, acceleration on learning. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I'm glad so I think out of these good. might be some of the most impactful ones. Effort. Effort. I heard effort. <laughs> Student, controls. Student control over learning. Okay. Self-verbalization. Yep, self-verbalization and self-questioning there. Integrate with prior knowledge. Integrate with prior knowledge. Why do you think that might be? Because um, of learning being a sort of um, build from foundational knowledge upward. Any other votes for top ones? Metacognitive strategies. Metacognitive strategies. Uh, organization at top. Yeah, organization at top. Folks know what that is? I mean, obviously, that's sort of even note taking is a form of organization, right? Organizing the content. Is the uh, spaced versus mass practice? Is the spaced like 
is that talking about like the like how you are studying or how you are yeah is that kind of like like let's say i was trying to get you to remember something i'd ask you is it now and then like 30 seconds from now i'd ask you again we keep ramping up the time until you can actually remember yeah exactly or you know students studying right it's a little bit of a time i'm gonna spend 30 minutes today 30 minutes tomorrow versus i'm cramming i'm just cramming for the test okay. that's masked okay do what i'm sorry Peer tutoring. Peer tutoring. Okay. Well, let's take a peek. So there's the answers. Yes, we were right on definitely like the organization. Metacognition is a strong one. Self regulation is pretty similar. Um, folks know what metacognition refers to? thinking about your thinking that's vague right um, it's kind of monitoring your learning how am I going about this being aware of that I'm trying this particular strategy you're monitoring it does it work or not evaluating it at the end you know, did I do good on my homework my quiz did I get this what do I need to do differently if anything okay so just really kind of being very aware conscious and there's models out there. I mean, there's very detailed models in my field out there you can look up. Um, so transfer strategies. Nobody picked up on that one. Another big one. And that's kind of specific strategies and practice of using knowledge, skills, in different contexts, different settings, transferring it to new problems, things like that. We're terrible at that, by the way, on the average. <laughs> but when you do it, it's very powerful. And teachers, again, this is what I was saying, a lot of these, you know, these are student things, but we've shown in my field, a lot of teachers can highly influence that right? by setting up different sort of problems that are similar but different, having them apply it in a new way in an assignment, things of that nature. So teachers can have an impact on these. Student control over learning, not as impactful as I, I mean, I know that was a surprise to me when I saw that. So again, a lot of these things are obviously in the desired or stronger range. Rehearsal, memorization, I heard somebody say that. It is very impactful, right? Just trying to read Say it. Say it again and again. Yeah. Works. Thanks for eating with prior knowledge. Blinking on your name. Um, Mention Elizabeth. Elizabeth mentioned that. Um, actually, that's one of the most powerful things, right? In part, we we believe our memories, you know, organized, and when you activate that organizational structure, mental schema, mental schema bring it to the forefront helps you learn, fit in the new information right into it. Very, very powerful. Effort, time on task, kind of similar. A good old under, underlining, highlighting, right? You've often heard, I've heard people say, that doesn't work, highlighting. I still like to do it. Thankfully, it does have a benefit. What's that? Well, we're talking about the highlighting. There's a for me, highlighting doesn't work for me because I end up highlighting everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have judicious <laughs> highlighting here. Yeah. Uh, um, and again, it may not work for you, right? In every subject, every every context. But you know, the point is, these are strategies you could you could use yourself, share with the students that may or may not work in your particular field subject. But again, and now you kind of also see why. Remember that big piece of variance was the student? Here's why, right? A lot of what they do matters. Matching style of learning. I heard, yeah. yes, you did not, not like this, I right? Personally don't like it. Personally don't I like personally it. Personally don't like it. Yes. <laughs> why is that? Jeffrey, right? Yeah. Well, like I had said to you, I, I like to. Um, I understand that we have to do it a little bit, but I like students to get out of their comfort zone. And I feel like if I match their learning too much, they're not learning how to learn in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, 
but I understand to start out, you would probably want to match it because they might not know what it is at all. Okay. So I just in reverse them. I want to make that clear. And I would argue it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> right? It's huge out there. And my field, I mean, I've had students that are teachers in K-12 settings. They, their principals make them do a lesson for your visual, your auditory, and your kinesthetic learner. A lesson for each three types. It does not matter. Well, I'm so from the School of Music, and sometimes we teach things where there isn't other options. It's like, yeah. oh, music theory. No, this is this is what you have. This is how you need to learn it. Sure. <laughs> like, I can't match your style. I'm sorry. Right, like, exactly. And part of what, so we do have styles of learning, but part of it is that how we learn, we use all our senses, right? If we didn't, we would have been eaten by cheetahs years ago or something. I don't, you know, seriously, because you have to use, you got to hear, you got to see, you got to, all that. And we know we take in information through all those and learn. So, and in my field, I mean, this is so popular. Um, I hosted a webinar two summers ago, leading researcher in my field. And I mean, he like Googled it, and like 300,000 hits come up for this. It's out there, like you get a match to student style, you know, but not much evidence that it has. And it actually bumped up a bit. It used to be in the point twos. It's in the point three, I think it's point three two effect size right now. Um, but still, very small effect. And we've done a real rigorous randomized uh, experiment. I think it was published, I want to say 2016 in my field. That where they identified kids' learning style, matched to it, and actually I think that was college students, matched to it, no effect whatsoever. So, again, a lot of evidence that does not matter. Okay? All right. So now let's think about some teaching strategies that you might use. All right, looks like folks have mostly wrapped this up, I believe. Is that correct? All right, so what do you think are some of the big, most That's impactful ones here? Problem based learning. Problem based learning. Yeah. I heard. Feedback. Do what? Feedback. Feedback. Classroom discussion. Classroom discussion. Concept mapping. Concept mapping. <laughs> We're going to find <laughs> out. Setting standards for self judgment. I'm trying to be poker face, but. <laughs> no, that, um, you gave, you gave the game away. <laughs> Do what? <laughs> Self-judgment? Worked examples. Worked examples. In the sciences, right? That's common. Statistics, my field as well. Math, right? Look an example. Think their goal is intentions. Learning goals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, learning goal intentions, yeah. Yeah, Julia. Discovery-based teaching is it like in a lab where you... I think that's really good. Yeah, that came out of my field, a prominent ed psych ed researcher. It's um, in the true discovery form, you're not really giving them much guidance at all. Oh. You know, kind of go discover it, if you will. Okay. Um, there's more scaffolded now versions, um, and there's been actually a little debate on it in the literature. I don't know that anybody really uses it very extensively. Definitely not fully unscaffolded. All right. Any others? Inquiry-based Inquiry based teaching. Anybody use that? It's actually common in med schools in general. So I think maybe some of you all, health sciences, med school would pick up on that. But a lot of the research on that has been in med schools. OK? <laughs> task analysis, cognitive task analysis. Yes, you are correct. That's actually one of the more based powerful on ones as well. Medical school. So, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> Discovery based teaching, again, not much. Yeah, Small effect. What is the jigsaw method? So, the jigsaw method, off the top of my head, recollection, you, you get like a group of students and they go out and become experts on different pieces of the thing, the puzzle. And then they come back together. OK, I found, you know, found out this. I've got this. And then collectively, we understand the topic. Um, 
Lance and I think had an example of this. Might want to share. You're getting ready to do. Is it Lance? Uh, yeah, Lance. Lance. Uh, so uh, next week we're doing a plate tectonics lab in geology with our students, and they have four different maps with different types of data on there. So just like uh, Matt said, there'll there'll be one expert that'll look at a certain type of data. They'll come back and share that with the collective, and then they put all their their thoughts together, and then they an analyze you know what's going on with the, the plates of the earth. Mastery learning? Yeah. You know what that is? Uh, I have a thing in my head that you know if it's what you think about it. Yeah, I mean, it's basically students keep at it until they master it, right? They're sort of on their own pace. Um, actually, I got my master's degree at East Carolina University, and their med school Harvard. went to a mastery learning model there. Um, I don't know if like it's still that. Now it's 20 years ago, but. Do what? Is that like standard based? Yeah, I mean, you you know, you you have clearly these are the objectives we want students to master, be able to do. So you could say that's the standard, right? And once they achieve that, and they keep at it at their own pace, get multiple attempts, you know, versus a one shot, you're done, you fail, whatever, mm -hmm. sort of model. So so that doesn't necessarily like hold back the entire nice. group of okay. people. Like it's more of a pace based. Yeah. There's even been grants to kind of look at this and, you know, exactly in that, in that med school, how do they implement it? I'm not sure all the details, you know, maybe they put some limits on that. Okay, we got three years to get through anatomy and physiology. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I think it would work. Uh, like, and that might be, that actually rings a bell. I think I remember one of my professors, who was a neuropsych, and he taught over there. I think they gave him like three chances to pass. The sort of key assessments. Um, so it was mastery, but also with limits, if I recall correctly. Yes. Um, I don't know about the jigsaw method or reciprocal teaching, if you could. Sure. So reciprocal teaching is a method where, like, um, it's kind of it's usually in dyads, pairs, and you know you take turn, you're teaching her, and then vice versa, she then teaches you. So. Peer. Usually it's peer. I mean, it can be even teacher to peer. You know, you, you act like you're the teacher and teach this to me. Yeah. And take turns, reciprocating who's the teacher, who's the learning, who's the learner. Hmm? Like they role play the teacher. Yeah. And a lot of times it's, it's in dyads of, of peers. Um, all right, so and problem-based learning, that's kind of getting popular right now. Um, little debate on this out in the literature, um, but so far, only been small effects. Mm -hmm. Classroom discussion, I heard questioning, somebody earlier said that. That's, that has a good impact. Julia, I think you brought that up. Anything else here jump out at you? Again, kind of reflects the fact, remember, that teacher, second biggest factor. And I didn't include everything here. There's other things when I give you the final. All right, lastly, let's look at technology, right? Huge push <laughs> in the world. I mean, technology and using it here at the university. Oh, here, Jeffrey, talking about clickers here. What was your experience with that? <laughs> Sound like a nightmare? Was that what I heard? Yeah, I, I don't think, I think they're harmful. I could be wrong, but I only use them logistically because I taught history of rock and roll and that was a 500 person like class. Mm. And I'm like, I'm not gonna fill 500 emails. I'm not gonna take 500 pieces of paper. I'm going to clicker answers. And it can, it was like, went into an Excel spreadsheet. It was nice and pretty. I understand student, it's very easy to get lost in the sea of students and cheat and do things like that with the clickers. But sure. I just, I couldn't be grading five. And I had three courses, so it's like 1,500 things I'm not gonna grade every two days. Exactly. Just click. Come on. <laughs> That's why I say great example. I mean, technology has a place, right? You have to use it in many of our fields. You got to learn how to use it, right? Plain and plain and simple. But overall, not much benefit of it. I mean, in some, you know, few cases, the college students are. Kids with special needs, it's beneficial. You know, there's big pushes out there, one-on-one -on -one laptops. I mean, a lot of the schools I go do research at, um, 
they have that for kids. Not much benefit of that. The mobile phone thing, I'm not sure. I need to look into a little. I've got a colleague in College of Ed that studies that. Um, that's new. I know a new finding that that's beneficial, and I need to look more into why. But and of course, PowerPoint, like I'm using today, hey, not very, not very helpful, right? But we use it. Um, can you yes, sir. describe what is meant by technology distance education? That. Um, yeah, it's I would, like an essential feature rather than an option. I know. Um, I mean, I think it means, you know, a lot of colleagues of mine use various technology tools within distance education from um, trying to think of like, you know, the narrated PowerPoints, um, wikis of people abuse. Uh, okay, so different. Other so tech a, a suite kind of technologies, tools. A suite of tools rather than, this is somebody speaking of teaching distance education for 10 years. So a suite of tools rather than right. just one or two used very well. Mm -hmm. gotcha. I'll have to double check that, but that's my recollection. So, not saying again we don't have to use it, but I mean, <coughs> we obviously do at times, but not, don't expect it to solve problems, right? This is why a lot of people in my field say, it's not about technology, it's the pedagogy. Right? It's all the things we just saw. How you teach, what kids do, and what you try and get them to do. Yeah, Julie. So when PowerPoint isn't effective, what is, like, I mean, to show a lot of stuff. This, okay. Be a good teacher. <laughs> yeah. Use effective teaching yeah. tools and strategies. Right? I feel like it's and get hard. kids to use effective teaching yeah. and learning approaches. So why is this not happening? Why is every lecture a PowerPoint presentation? Well, because I think like we heard starting off here today, most of us don't base it on existing research, what we know about what's effective, right? We base it on what we think, you know, what we just sort of do, what we, the approach we take in our field versus you know, like I said, for me as an educational researcher and scientist, this is my frame of reference. You know, and which of these can work for you in your class with your students and so forth. Pick from a menu is what I'm giving you. No, it wasn't talking about using PowerPoint as a form of disseminating information. It was saying don't use it as your teaching strategy. Right. Oh, okay. Like you could still use it as a tool. Sure. Right. You will have to, like we're using it right. now. Was, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. But again, it's the pedagogy, how you're, how you're using it. Like, a lot of people focus on what yeah. you use, not why. Huh? So I'm focused on using this PowerPoint because I think it's powerful. That's not important, that's important. Why you're. <laughs> so the last thing I'm going to pass around is sort of the cheat sheet. Um, all 250 some odd things. There's other categories on here. So I, I picked out kind of the three, I think, main areas most relevant, applicable to us here today. It's similarly color-coded. Dark blue is very impactful, and it has the effect sizes actually on here too. Light blue is, is impactful. Um, green is the small teacher effects yeah. and so forth. So. It's a quick, easy reference if you want to see. And again, you can go to actually this website. If you just Google visible learning, you'll find it. His overall effects. This one kind of shows them all together, rank ordered. This I'm giving you breaks them out into these general areas like I've done a bit today. And look into his 2012 book. Like I said, if you want to learn more and, and he gives some really good tips in there on how to implement some of these. Any final questions, comments from anybody? Oh, I have, I have a question. Yes, sir. Yes, Jim. How, maybe it's not for this setting, but what would be a better way to learn some of these strategies? So we're talking about like which ones work more than others, but that doesn't help the fact some of, some of us that aren't education majors, we never actually get sat down and go, well, this is how you do these. This yeah. is what they are and to learn them. 
So it's one thing to know that, like sure. know how they impact, but I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, you're <laughs> gonna have to look into it a little bit, attend workshops, you know, maybe uh -huh. they'll you have some of these on the schedule here at CTE. Um, you know, there's a lot of different avenues to try and pick some of these up. Um, there's good resources online, tons of examples out there of the jigsaw method, for example. You know, look at those, pick one that you think might work for you. Um, and look at look at workshops, other professional development opportunities. Okay. All right, we are at the end of the time. I want to thank Matthew for sharing. <laughs>